Hi everyone. We are getting ready for Easter Sunday, <clears throat> this coming Sunday. And our scripture for this week is uh, from the book of John, the 20th chapter. I'm Pastor Jen, the interim associate here at Our Saviors, and uh, I will be sharing the scripture with you. And we begin early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb and the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? <clears throat> Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this message, this word of hope that we cling to as we continue our walk through this holy week. We pray that you inspire us with your promises that are never ending and inspire us with this story, uh, this word of truth that you are always a God of new life and resurrection. In Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 You know, as I was um, listening to you read that, Jen, and as I was thinking about our conversation uh, on this with staff just a short time ago, <laughs> I, I thought throughout John's gospel, Jesus is intentional about everything. Um, I mean, Jesus is orchestrating all of the activity, all of the movement, everything that's happening. Um, so it, it's very difficult for me to believe that he, he just by accident showed up to Mary instead of Peter and the other disciple. Um, I mean, who, who Jesus first showed himself to is a choice that he made. Um, I'm curious what you all think about why that's a choice that Jesus made. Why Mary? Why not Peter and the other disciple? My response would be because it would be so counter to the culture of the time. If you wanted to find someone that was a credible witness, you would go to a man or two men and say, go and tell others that you saw me. Uh, but Jesus is, is introducing a whole new kingdom. The kingdom isn't built on the culture. Um, it's, it's a whole new way of bearing witness or telling the truth here. And he's using one of the least likely sources for that or the least in the, in the chain there. Um, and that's a woman and I commend him for it. I mean, I think it's marvelous, uh, that he would choose her to be the first witness to his resurrection. 
I think it also says a lot about Mary, uh, that she is a true disciple and that she is uh, a true follower and, and that Jesus entrusts her with this message. I think it says a lot about her, um, her ability to understand and to share this message with others. Uh, I notice she calls him Lord yet. And yet, when she says, uh, you know, the term Lord, I don't know quite all that meant to her. But uh, even though she calls him Lord, she doesn't necessarily grasp hold of the fact that this has been a resurrection, as he said he would resurrect himself here. So there's a little bit of conflict in that in those terms there that I see. But I would agree, though, that I think she's a very, very credible source there to uh, to go to. Mm -hmm. So often when we think of the disciples, we think of the 12, and we don't remember that there were many uh, followers of Jesus that included women. So I like that Mary is, is yeah. an active part I think of you could make a case that John uses uh, the role of women here in a very uh, extreme kind of way for his gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, not so much, but I would say certainly with John that women are elevated to a different place uh, as witnesses, credible witnesses, disciples, followers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does turn things on its head. Um, yeah. Considering the, the culture that he was a part of and the traditions that people held to. Um, and, and just to remind, you know, those who are, are watching this at that time, <clears throat> the testimony of a woman was not accepted in a court of law. Um, women could not um, inherit her own property. I mean, just on and on and on. And, and it stood, didn't it stand the test of time if John's gospel was written later here, maybe what, close to 90? Yep. And uh, so we're looking at a half a century or better that uh, this story has been now floating around and yet he continues to use Mary as one of the credible witnesses here to the, this amazing truth here. So how did, we, go ahead. how did we then go so off the rails um, to, you know, from, from this early, not, not just um, acceptance of, of women, but elevation of women as, you know, as witnesses um, for the faith, how, how did we go so off the rails to a church that would not allow, you know, f for, I mean, millennia that would not allow women in the pulpit, um, et cetera, et cetera? Well, you didn't have to go far before Paul starts writing about the congregations that were getting all stirred up, you know, and he said, oh, no, nope, we got to keep the women quiet. They can't be doing this, can't be doing that. I think those, they were situational moments that got cast into a general broadcasted kind of say this is what is normative now for the congregations for the role of women and I, I think it was a misuse of what Paul was trying to do to maintain just some sense of order in those congregations I mean yeah, I think you get the last word on this one Jen <laughs> yeah because Mary is is clearly a preacher here and so um, it is interesting it's like it's cultural and I think Jesus was so far ahead of his time and not just about women, but about so many things culturally and in, in the social structure that, that um, people just did not like who he lifted up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think his kingdom was built on equality. You know, there wasn't uh, male or female. I mean, that's stated in the scripture, Jew or slave, Greek, free, male. I mean, I think he was trying to erase those things, not like we're trying to do today. I think there's a different kind of erasure going on today, but I think he was talking about equality in terms of oneness in as the community of faith. Mm -hmm. And that got all out of whack too, because then we started elevating certain male figures in the church. You know, we made them, we gave them a title and then they got power hungry and then they goofed it all up. <laughs> it's, it's, um, I prefer saying they um, instead of we. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the idea uh, 
that Mary and, and these people, women that Jesus had around him, he um, he valued them because they were women and that they had some a valuable perspective and um, and I think that's important too in in that women aren't just able to preach, but that women bring something special to the table mm. um, just because of who we are. And so I think that's important to lift up to. Right. And, and, and I think that's, um, it's two different things. One, it's, it's because of who women are. And, and two, it's because of the position women were in, um, you know, that, that, you know, people who weren't expecting or wanting everything that the people in power were expecting and wanting were in a position to hear and see Jesus in a way that they were not. Um, and then, you know, just by virtue, not just of, of the position that they were in, but who women were, they were inclined to listen to and see dif Jesus differently as well. Yeah. I think it's very appropriate that you're preaching on Sunday, Jen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're following in the tradition of Mary. That's right. I could lift that up on Sunday. And, and Steve and I will come racing into the sanctuary there, and I'll, <laughs> I'll let him win. Well, yeah, you have to be Peter. <laughs> I, I'll be Peter, yeah, the older. I'll, I'll be the disciple whom Jesus loved. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, also, you were Peter a few weeks ago, so that's why I'm just I'm still working on that multiple personality there. Anyway, oh, you know, yeah. on, a, on a very Poor practical Peter. side, you know, we've all stood at the graveside with families and looked into those empty dug holes. I mean, do you ever have those moments when you think, is it is it possible that the person that we're lowering down into the ground here is actually going to be raised to new life? Do you ever have those doubts like I do? Yeah, and not just the person, but this situation that, you know, is, you know, this this grave type situation that's yawning to, you know, open and swallow us whole. So it's not just the person that's being buried, but, you know, the reality that we're presently experiencing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I never lose sight of that, it, the honor that it is to preach a funeral sermon and uh, to be able to speak that word, even though, and it does uh, sometimes feel like an out of body experience where I'm like, how can I say these things in the midst of this difficulty? And yet the words come and the spirit moves and, and we are all comforted, mm -hmm. um, including me. And so to me, that's just such a holy, sacred thing. You know, and that makes me think a little bit um, sometimes when I do funerals for people who I don't know, you know, and there's the obligatory thing that someone in the family or someone says, gosh, you know, I'm sorry you had to do that. It must be hard preaching, a, doing a funeral for someone you don't know. And my response is actually no, um, because if I don't know the person, then I'm not tempted to eulogize, you know, no. if I don't know the person, then um, I get to do what I'm called to do, which is proclaim the gospel. And I, I wonder if that is has to do with Jesus' choice to come to Mary, that when Jesus comes to Mary and Mary delivers the word, it's, it's the word itself, the news itself um, that they are hearing, um, as opposed to if, if Peter and you know, the other disciple had said it maybe, you know, it's more about them. Um, you know, that that here it's it's simply the proclamation. I'm not confused with, you know, any positional leadership or anything like that. It's it's simple proclamation of, of the gospel. I find uh, too, and I what I call these, and I mean it in a good way, mercenary funerals, when I'm brought into a situation where families don't have church pastor for whatever reasons. I find that sometimes they're trying to convince me of uh, this person's life. <coughs> they were, they're, they're worthy of something beyond, you know, uh, just being here on earth. They're in a better place sometimes they'll say. And I, I will jokingly say, well, are they in Wisconsin or where are they? You know, uh, 
you know, you can you can laugh a little bit with them, but in all seriousness, I say, you know, it isn't my job to make any judgments anyway. Uh, I'm with you. I just do not know the person because my job is, I said, is threefold: that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Mm -hmm. You don't get any better news than that, and that's all you need to know. You hold on to those three things, and uh, that'll outlast you. A good place, I think, to um, cap it off. Yeah, good last word. And everybody, have a wonderful Holy Week. Um, remember, we're, we're worshiping Thursday evening at um, 8 o'clock, Friday evening also at 8 o'clock. And it's, it's late enough on Friday evening um, instead of our typical 7 in the evening because we want to wait until it's darker and we have a late Easter. Um, and then Easter Sunday, we worship at 8, 9, 30, and 11. So hope to see you all there. Um, God bless. Peace to you. God bless.